Welcome to the AWS Summit 2021, and thanks for tuning into our session on how to build a successful SaaS business on AWS. I'm Peter, I'm a manager in the AWS startup team in Singapore, and over my four years at AWS, I had the incredible opportunity to speak with and work with a lot of software companies in the region. Together with Aki, founder and COO of Bamboo, we want to share a bit of what we have learned and we hope it's helpful for you. Let's talk about the why SaaS. I think SaaS has such a big impact on how enterprises are consuming software and has created a few of the most exciting unicorns around the world, and I'm sure you followed a couple of the IPOs. Uh, but why is that? First, enterprise software has not innovated as much as their consumer counterparts. Similar to how consumers got frustrated with their shopping experience, their taxi rides, their access to services, enterprises are tired of signing multi-year, multi-million dollar contracts for software that does subsequently not live up to the expectations. And on top of that, doesn't solve their business problem. Instead, they want free trials, they want to test drive, and they don't want to wait one year for the delivery. Second, payments. Instead of upfront payments, SaaS is often tied to outcome and success, which is obviously the preferred way of payment for customers. They want to start small and pay as they go. For startups, on the other hand, SaaS is promising high margins and a predictable revenue stream. David Scott said at the Web Summit, one car sold in 2020 means no car sold in 2021, at least usually. In, 2000, in SaaS, uh, one million dollar of revenue in 2020 means one, 1.5 million dollars of revenue in 2021. This is what is attracting VCs. Entry barriers are significantly lower for software startups than for asset heavy companies. All you need is an idea, manpower, and a lot, a lot of stamina. And last, innovation. The speed in which SaaS can roll out features is much faster than for traditional software simply because the logistics are so much simpler. But also things like big data and AIML. They have become much more accessible to SaaS companies because of the centralized deployments and also because of cloud providers like AWS. In ASEAN, in the SaaS space, most startups are still at an early stage, seed or series A. We are seeing a lot of fintechs, B2B e-commerce solutions, marketing technology, analytics, and AI. And because of recent history, logistics and health tech are seeing a big uptick. I like to distinguish between three types of deployments that these SaaS companies choose on AWS. First, self-service multi-tenant SaaS. Customers are sharing infrastructure and the database the onboarding process is fully automated and companies can adopt the software without support of sales or service functions. Second, a single tenant SaaS, uh, which we are seeing a lot with SaaS startups that are in regulated industries where customers are concerned about data breaches or tenant isolation that choose to put each customer into their own virtual private cloud with their own database. And last, lift and shift migrations. These startups have only just gotten started with cloud and are taking a legacy architecture that cannot really auto scale and doesn't have automation in it to AWS. Now, all of these companies would be saying they're doing SaaS, but there is obviously an inherent benefit the more you are going to the left in terms of margins, ease of management, management and speed of growth. AWS is a big advocate of multi-tenant SaaS and we are actively supporting startups on their journey. But before we go there, I want to share some of our observations working with many SaaS companies over the years. First is business. The vast majority of SaaS companies, as I mentioned, are at an early stage. Um, there are series, series B companies in Indonesia or Singapore or Thailand are actually rare. With that, product market fit is the single most important thing for founders. Think about your buyer, understand him or her very well. I talk with a lot of software companies that struggle to clearly articulate their value proposition to a buyer. This leads to bad conversion rates, often bad understanding of what the price of the product should be. You need to understand that the product 
could add different value to a head of marketing compared to a head of data, and that a head of marketing might also have a different budget than a head of data. Now, you know you got it right when you found early customers that love you and never want to give you away. As you are going through this process of finding product market fit, understand and measure KPIs in your funnel. SaaS is built around simple metrics, leads, conversions, ARR, and retention. In the beginning, startups are typically going after every customer that returns their phone call. But then, the more you grow up, the more you want to be in markets where your CAC, cost of acquisition is low and retention is high. Figure out how your conversion is different in different industries with different personas, and if you are targeting different ASEAN markets, how do these numbers look like in each market? If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. In AWS, we like to say, let numbers guide your decision. And only scale your sales team if you found a repeatable sales process. This means lead sources, this means value proposition. Otherwise, you're going through and burn through your money very fast. Next, don't make yourself look like a local company if you are self-service. There are a lot of exciting SaaS businesses and self-service SaaS models in ASEAN. A lot of these startups, however, naturally limit themselves to their country. On the website, it would say something like location, Singapore, and Malaysia. I often mention to these companies, if you have a digital service, a digital support team, to a large extent a digital sales team, go global or at least regional. Maybe you're going to get surprised by traction that you see in markets you have completely overlooked, and in fact, I've seen that in the past. Lastly, in 2020, we have faced a very difficult year, and I've seen some startups adopting to these changes faster than others. For example, do you need salespeople that travel across countries? Do you need to hire in individual countries? What is the innovation and the market opportunity for you as a startup? Or do you maybe need to pivot and do something else? And what services can you offer that help your customers with their business? I have seen companies that were able to shift fast. I have seen companies that were not able to adjust quickly. My advice is figure out what is your new norm and make bold decisions. Now, on the tech side, a big part of the presentation, and I spend a lot of my time telling startups to keep their eyes on multi-tenant SaaS, even if your customers are not open to it yet. If you are targeting to have more than 20 customers, deployments and maintenance of SaaS applications in customers' on-prem environments are not sustainable. Updating your software, new releases, troubleshooting, without access, you've probably been there. I believe that multi-tenant SaaS is going to be the norm in the future. And this is where you can achieve the SaaS promise of high margins and fast growth. I'll leave it with that, and I'll let Aki talk about it more during his slides. Second, lean into your cloud provider. Leave the undifferentiated heavy lifting to AWS. Use our managed services and ask us about security, scalability, best practices, and the core components of SaaS. A lot of our solution architects are former CTOs. They have been there, done that, and they're happy to support you. Third, if you are early stage, focus on value for your customers. I've seen a lot of startups that fall in love with specific technologies, spend a lot of their time adopting these technologies without understanding the implications for their business or their customer. Technology follows business priorities, not the other way around. And last, those that are building multi-tenant SaaS, get yourself a good database guy, especially if you're using relational databases. We have seen a lot of Series A companies on oversized databases because queries were not optimized. The developer that built the original schema has left, and nobody's really a database expert because they're very tough to get. Especially if you're write heavy, consider non-relational databases or other purpose-built databases. Understand your read and write patterns and have a conversation with our database specialist. They can give you advice. 
But now, let's talk a little bit more about how AWS can help you and how you should be working with us. Over the years, we have seen a rising demand of software companies that want to transition to multi-tenant SaaS. A lot of them are on-prem legacy companies, but more and more we are realizing that also startups are transitioning to multi-tenant SaaS solutions and are looking for technical guidance and support, but also on business topics, they are looking for our help. So we have developed a program called SaaS Factory which gives you direct access to technical and business content, best practices and architectures that can guide you and your team. This program is free to participating companies and you can join at all stages. Join our APN program. We are happy to sign you up if you are willing to build a SaaS business on AWS, even if you are already doing multi-tenant SaaS. So what is covered? In our SaaS factory, we will cover things like product strategy, go-to-market, packaging, and pricing. We have specific well-architected reviews for SaaS, and we build a framework to get you onto the path. Moving to SaaS is a transformation. So this framework helps startups to extend their vision beyond pure technology, putting a greater emphasis on business models that create excellent customer experiences. Companies like Freshworks, F5, Dynatrace all have joined this program. Now, I would like to hand over to Aki, who is going to tell you his story of Bamboo and why and how they adopted multi-tenant SaaS on AWS. Hi guys, my name is Aki Ranin. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Bamboo, which is a B2B fintech company. Over the next few slides, I'll describe our SaaS transformation journey that we've been doing as part of the AWS SaaS Factory program. Uh, first, a few words about Bamboo before SaaS. So Bamboo just turned five years a few weeks ago, in fact. Uh, so far, our main business has been building robo-advisor solutions for mainly large financial institutions around the world. Uh, the way that we've been doing that is building front ends and integrations around a shared set of APIs. This model has worked pretty well for us, but it does have its limits in terms of scalability. So why did we need SaaS? Um, if we're honest, there's hardly any non-SaaS companies around anymore if you go by the marketing websites. Uh, I mean, anybody can charge a subscription fee, but self-service multi-tenant is another ball game altogether. Um, so if we look at the hype cycle, which is a kind of a common framework, uh, I think there's a right time for SaaS, and it's usually not early on. Um, and the reason for that, I'll, I'll sort of explain through our own use case. We started robo-advisory pretty early on in 2015 and 16, and no one really, including us, knew what to do. Over the next few years, the requirements have sort of converged into something we can actually package as a product. Um, now we feel is the right time to do SaaS in our particular market. And some days, API calls, I think, will be our main revenue source, but we're not there yet. Okay, so how did we do that? Um, these are some of the metaphors that we've used for our product evolution internally, uh, just to sort of pave our way from custom builds to SaaS. The largest clients, um, they'll always want a Rolls Royce, which is sort of the, the high-end offering. Um, they're willing to pay for it, and they're willing to wait for it to be tailored to their you know, exacting specifications. We always knew that the end game would be SaaS, but we needed something in between, kind of like a stopgap in between while the demand was building up. Right now, Bamboo Go, that's our product name, is effectively the Toyota. Uh, and so is Tango, which we've just released with Franklin Templeton and Apex uh, in the U.S. market. Um, the key thing for us was to be able to fix the back end, which is very hard to do when the regulations for each country are different. So how did we do SaaS? Well, given that we were in the enviable position of having raised a bunch of money after Series B, we took an unusually long-term view on SaaS, at least for a startup. Um, we were either going to take our time and do it right or not do it at all. So what we did is we set aside a dedicated team, which is also not something you typically do in startups. Um, 
the main thing that we really wanted to focus on was uh, scalability through multi-tenancy. So what could go wrong, right? Um, well, we expected it was going to be hard for moving from single tenant microservices to a multi-tenancy, and I'll be honest, uh, it was hard. Uh, it took us many attempts and probably around six months just to get a working proof of concept. Given we still had you know, limited time and money, we thought we had to make some compromises, and at the end of the day, we chose uh, to compromise on flexibility and maintainability, which probably are going to bite us someday later. Um, this also sort of forces our hand uh, and narrows our use case to one country. So in this case, what we're doing is direct-to-consumer in America, not direct-to-consumer in Bamboo, but through our clients so that there is an actual consumer end user. We also learned that many of the third-party APIs that we needed to connect to to actually offer a transactional service uh, are not designed to operate multi-tenant to multi-tenant. Uh, they're expecting single clients to integrate with their APIs. Uh, plus, in finance, you know, when you're onboarding through these APIs and you're putting new clients on, uh, the onboarding time could be weeks instead of minutes, which people are used to in sort of the SaaS and API world. One of the biggest takeaways from me in terms of our experience so far, especially from the SaaS factory experience, is that I think we've been focused too much on technology. At the end of the day, I don't think SaaS is just about the technical ability for multi-tenancy. Uh, while that's hard, at the end of the day, you're trying to operate a successful subscription business. I'm not one to give praise lightly, but I would say the Sauce Factory team has been a huge surprise to me. Uh, we expected you know, top-level architects, as you would think from AWS, but I think what's been special to me is that they really have A-grade people that have run successful Sauce platforms, and these people can help you guide your overall product strategy. So if you're eligible, I think you should talk to them honestly. Even if you haven't planned to do Sauce yet, I think it's something that any startup who goes far will end up uh, doing at some point. So do yourself a favor. Thank you. There are two more things that I want to highlight. First, join our Global Startup Partner Program. This program is designed to not only help you build your SaaS product on AWS, but it's your gateway into building a go-to-market strategy with us. I'm personally very excited to help ASEAN-based companies to expand their business around the world and leverage the presence of AWS um, around the globe. Now, the startup program is designed to give you access to things like lead sharing, leads coming from you to AWS or the other way around. It is aligned behind our core competencies uh, that we are going to market with, like financial service, healthcare or government or use cases like AIML. Now here are a couple of startups that I want to highlight that joined this program. We have Synopsys, Hashtags, Parcel Perform and vSense. A quote that I really like comes from the Chief Commercial Officer of vSense, Brandon. In 2020, we brought our relationship with AWS to a new level, establishing a close relationship between vSense sales team from around the world and their peers from AWS. We are very keen to produce more of such success stories. Speaking of success stories, we love to collaborate with startups on creating digital content. Whether these are video case studies, here for example, 2C2P or ActiveII, written case studies like the one from Horangi, podcasts like the one with Perks, or blog posts like the one with Anchanto. Tell us what impact your solution has on your customers and work with us to tell your story. You joined the AWS Summit to learn and you can keep learning after the summit with resources from AWS training and certification. We offer many available free on-demand courses as well as virtual instructor-led trainings. Learn more at aws.com slash training. Thanks for listening in. I hope you find the session useful and don't forget to fill out the survey for our session. And we are looking forward to speak with you about your SaaS business and how we can support it.